I am Cammie Cavanaugh Rawlings, and I used to play in a band called Lavender Couch. Um, how was the name Lavender Couch made? How, what does the name mean? Well, it came from a book. Uh, it, I believe, if I, if I remember right, it was a book written by a psychiatrist about lesbians. So Lavender Couch is how we got the name, just from the book. We stole it. <laughs> Did you grow up in Omaha? I did grow up in Omaha. Um, I was born in Atlanta, and we moved here when I was two. And I did leave for a little bit, for a couple years. I went to school in Oklahoma because I wanted to get out of here so bad. And then I went to school in Oklahoma, and I thought, oh my god, when, do I, when can I go home? So <laughs> I've been here ever since. I'm glad I stayed. Why Omaha? What makes Omaha special? Well, when I was growing up, I think Omaha had just started to kind of become more of a city. I always felt like it was kind of a town when I was growing up. Um, I felt like it started to really branch out with music and art, and it was just starting to grow. And now, how many years later, I think it's a thriving metropolis. I think it's great. I think it's become a really great place to be. How has Omaha changed since you were growing up? Omaha's changed a lot. You know, when I left for college at 120th and Q, there was a drive-in, and I don't think much else. And when I came back from college, there were houses, and that was in 1988. And since then, it has grown and grown and grown. We're halfway to Lincoln. Um, and we've become a really respectable city. I think we attract good people here for work. I think we have a wide, wide variety of people. And again, I think we've become a great town for arts and music. With your band Lavender Couch, what are some of the venues you guys played together in Omaha? We played venues that are no longer here. The Capitol Bar, a lot, which is right east of the Federal Building on Capitol downtown. It's now an office building. We played the Howard Street Tavern, which I loved, which was in the Old Market, which I think is now a flower shop. And then there was a venue out west that did really well off 120th and Center called McFarland's. We played there a lot, too. There was no Benson at the time at all. There was nothing like this at the time. So we have a lot more venues now than we did. What was the Omaha 90s indie scene like? The Omaha 90s indie scene, it kind of ran the gamut from singer-songwriters to harder rock to our band, which was, I think, Omaha's, well, I know it was Omaha's first lesbian band. Um, so everybody was inclusive. It was, I felt like it was a lot more inclusive back then uh, as far as indie music went because it could range from songwriters to full-on band. Um, it's changed a lot since then, but back then I feel like it was more inclusive for sure. How do you think you guys impacted the Omaha scene? Well, I would like to think that we encourage more women to play. And at the time, I feel like there were a lot more women. There were a lot more singer-songwriters back then. Uh, there were a lot of bands that had women in it that were either playing bass, maybe not the lead singer, but there were women in the band. I think that Omaha really didn't know what to do with us because we were an all-girl band. So that was kind of a new thing. There was a band before us called Tomboy. and. Uh, Allison, I'm trying to think of her name, Karen Allison, who was a jazz singer, I think was in that, and they played at Skateland. But we were the first lesbian band, and Omaha didn't know what to do with us at all. They didn't know what to think of us. But when they came to see us, they were like, wow, they're really good. And they didn't know what to do with the whole bar full of lesbians that were there, because the lesbians loved us, because there was nobody like us. And so once the bars, though, realized that this crowd of lesbians would drink all of their Bud Light, they're like, come back for a second night. So they were always happy to have us. And we always had a full house. And then the word got out, and more people who were not lesbians would come. Our parents came. We had friends. It was great. We had a great crowd. How did your sexuality influence your music? Well, back then, I think a lot. Uh, we wrote about lots of stuff. There was no such thing as gay marriage back in the early 90s, so we had a song that we wrote called Wife. Uh, we wrote a song about Handmaid's Tale, which is a Margaret Atwood book, which is now really popular, I think, on Hulu, but we wrote about it then. You know, we were angry young lesbians. We had a lot to say, and we tried to say it in our two to three minute songs. And it did. We wrote about whatever. No bars hold.
do you think things are improving for LGBTQ plus uh, people in the industry? I hope so. I think so. I have to believe that it is after everything that has transpired in the last several decades. I'm a little worried about the future. I'm not going to lie about that. But I think as far as industry, as the music industry goes, there's so many people now that I can't keep up that are pansexual or I don't even know half of them. But like I think of Janelle Monet. Um, I think back to Boy George. I think about all these people along the way that, yeah, they're musicians, but they're also gay, or they're bi, or they're pansexual, or they're transsexual. I think that it has got to be better now. I think it's got to be more accepting. Speaking of some of the issues you had to face as a woman, what specific obstacles did you, your band, go through? We, every single show we got really good for some girls, pretty good for chicks. It was so exhausting. And it was like, you know, the first time you're like, oh, okay, thanks. And then you're like, what does that even mean? What, what does that mean? You know, I really liked you. I'm surprised because you guys are girls. And it's like, <laughs> okay, so only guys can do this, you know? But that was the biggest thing we got. And nobody could believe that five women could keep it together long enough to make a song, let alone a whole set, you know? So that was our biggest hurdle. This question um, has to do with women in the industry, but how do you think the hashtag Me Too movement will impact women in the music industry? Well, I hope that it impacts it in a positive way. I hope that women will be more inclined to share their stories. If they can't speak them, perhaps they can sing them. They can write poetry. They can paint. They can do photos. Hopefully, the Me Too movement will encourage women to speak out more. I think it has. I think it has, and I think we'll see more of that as we go along. Another heavier sort of question. How do you feel indie treats uh, minority groups and people of color, and do you have anything to share that relates to that? I think indie would be more inclusive than, say, something like country or rap or metal. I could be wrong. If I remember right, I don't know her name. I can't remember, but there's a lesbian country singer, A one that I know of, but I don't know her name. But I think that indie is more inclusive um, because it runs the gamut, like I said, from singer-songwriters to full-on bands to all kinds of different genres within that indie kind of overhang. But I've always felt like indie is kind of DIY. It's kind of bring your best, you do your best, and you present it. And I think that indie is open to, it can be open to anybody. And it was back in the 90s. Well, we were always DIY, Lavender Couch, because we were broke. We didn't, we, no label picked us up, and we didn't really have money to, at the time it was you either made a record or a cassette. Well, we couldn't afford a record, so we made a cassette. <laughs> and we did it locally with our good friend Gary Lind at Eclipse Studio, and we designed the cover. We, like, our friend took the picture. I think she hand wrote it all out. We printed it at Kinko's and then we folded it all in there and we had it printed locally, the actual cassette. So it was very DIY because to me DIY is what you can do and what you can afford to make things happen. And that's how I've approached all of my bands because I don't have any money but I want to put something out. We'll just make it a home. So that's what we did. And DIY I think makes it accessible Whatever you want to do, as long as you can do it, do it. With your band, what's the moment you felt empowered or alive? Like, what was your peak? We peaked super early. Uh, we invited Ani DeFranco to Omaha. And keep in mind, we had only been playing uh, Earl Bates used to do this open mic show at the Saddle Creek Bar, which is now a business. Um, and we would just go play open mic. We would have like three or four songs. We'd jump on the stage, play a couple songs. We did a lot of coffee houses. We had never really done a full on show. And my, at the time I worked at a record store called Pickles Records and Tapes. It's over where, it used to be over where Methodist is now, 84th and Dodge. And my boss went up to go see a band called Television in Chicago, and I was watching the store. And he came back and he said, I saw this woman open for television and I thought you'd like her. So thanks for watching the store. I brought you this present and it's a cassette. 
and it was Ani DeFranco's pedal dive. And just the picture alone, I'm like, what is this? Because she's got these little dreads and everything. And then I put it in and I was just like, I had never heard anything like that. The way she plays that guitar, the way she sang her lyrics. I was like, what is this? And I couldn't wait to get done with my shift at 3 p.m. Get home, I called the band, call everybody in Lavender Couch and say, you gotta come over and hear this tape. They came to my basement and we sat there and we were like, what is this? And back then there was no internet. And in her tape, there was like a PO box and a phone number. So us not knowing any better, we literally pick up the phone and call Ani DeFranco and say, hey, oh my God, we totally love you. We're in Omaha, will you come play here? She's like, yeah, 300 bucks on an airline ticket. Well, 300 bucks, we're like, how are we gonna get $300? So I think we played some shows and we made the $300 and she came and she slept on my bass player's floor. We all hung out and we had her play at a little, you know how apartments have like a meeting room or a rec room? There was one right across from the fire station downtown that somebody lived in and we rented that room for like $100. We got a keg of beer and we opened for Ani DeFranco. And I still look back at that and think, what in the world? Because we didn't know any better. We didn't know like, I don't know, just ask her, just ask her. And she came and it was amazing. And she radically changed me and she radically changed how Lavender Couch was as a band. I remember her telling me, just play that guitar. It's just a piece of wood, just play it. I'm like, all right. And from that point on, I busted up a lot of guitars playing that guitar. But she was amazing. And I think we peaked early because that was our first big show. But we rode that momentum and we kept getting shows. And we did stay friends with Ani. In her live double album, she gives a shout out to the Omaha girls in it. That's us. But yeah, she really influenced us. But we didn't know any better and I love it because that was our big peak. <laughs> As you were saying, Ani DeFranco was definitely one of your inspirations. Who were other people who inspired you? Well, I grew up with music. My parents always had music on. My mom loved Motown. My dad was more of a rocker and had like Led Zeppelin and The Who and Guess Who. So I was kind of surrounded by music. Every time we were in the car, music, eight tracks whatever. Well, the 80s came along and so did MTV. And I remember when we first got MTV and I was so excited because I love music. And the very first video I saw was Eurythmics with Annie Lennox and her orange hair and I just was flabbergasted. I didn't know what to think. I was like, that is the coolest chick I've ever seen. She's wearing a tie, she has orange hair and she has this beautiful voice. Like I didn't know what to do with it. And then in the next couple of videos, here comes the Go-Go's. And I was sold. Five chicks, are you kidding me? All playing instruments in a band, jumping in a fountain, driving a convertible. I'm like, this is the life. And after that, I was bound and determined. I was going to move to LA. I was going to be the sixth go-go. That never happened, but I'm okay with it. Um, and that was in the 80s. Ani was 90s. And then the Indigo Girls, late 90s, when I was working at the record store, they radically changed my life too. So those were like the really big influences on my songwriting and playing. There's been others like Sean Colvin, Patty Griffin, all females. I really can't think of many men that have <laughs> influenced me, but mostly females, yeah. Where did you go to buy or listen to music? Well, back in the day, um, my parents were super cool. So me and my sister each had our own stereo system in our room. And so I would ride my bike, I would save up all my lunch money and ride my 10 speed, my red 10 speed down to Millard to the record store and buy records. And I'd bring them right home. And the first record I bought though, I bought it at Richmond Gordman, which is weird. I bought Culture Club and uh, the rest is history. I have a huge record collection still. I can't get rid of it. I still listen to them. I love it. I love records. There's nothing like them. But Pickles was the place. Back then there was Pickles, Homers, and Peaches. But I liked Pickles because they had more of the English. They had more imports. They had more dance music. So I liked Pickles better. How did a label of genre or comparison to other groups or artists hinder or motivate you? The thing about labeling Lavender Couch is kind of the same with all of my bands along the way. They're, they've been super hard to label because even I don't know what the genre is because as a songwriter, I've never limited myself to a certain like, I'm only gonna write rock music. I'm only gonna write sad love ballads. I write anything. 
I mean, some of the stuff I'm doing now is pretty bluesy and soul. Uh, we've done ballads, we did rock back then. I, I just kind of write what I want, so I've never been able to put any of my bands, including Lavender Couch, in any kind of genre. I guess back then people were like, well, they're lesbian rock. And I'm like, well, that's really a lazy label. <laughs> so I don't know. I've never been able to define any kind of genre or label for any of my bands. I would say back then, Lavender Couch was probably pop, I think, maybe folk pop. We never knew. Folk acoustic pop? I still don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We've been doing research on the Cog Factory of lots of pictures from the space. What was kind of like the vibe? What was, what was the rundown of it? Well, Rob Rath, he owned it, who happened to be a really good friend of Jamie Martig, who I worked with at the record store at Pickles. And so he already knew me. So we were friends. And it was a really run down, empty building. It might have been a car shop before. And they didn't do much to it. There was no heat. There was no air. I think they sold pop and water out of a cooler. The bathrooms were super scary. I mean, like, oh boy, I'm gonna hold it. Um, the bands, I feel like a lot of the stuff didn't work half the time on the stage. And how Lavender Couch, I think just because Rob liked us as friends is why we were included, because it was a lot of punk rock. It was a lot of loud, angry man music, a lot of boys. But we were always welcome, and I'm forever grateful for that, because we'd be on lineups where we'd play our songs, and then there's some screaming dude right after us. Like, it didn't make a lot of sense, but we were always welcome. It was a cool place for kids to hang out. If you weren't 21, you knew you had a place to go. They didn't care if you were gay. They didn't care what color you were. You were always welcome there. It, I wish we still had it. Maybe with some heating and air and better bathrooms, but yes. <laughs> so do you still play music? I do. I am in a band called Bathtub Maria and we're getting ready to record in August. Oh, next month. <laughs> Next month, we're getting ready to record. And uh, it's me and my wife and three other guys, and I love it. It's incredible. It's, I think it's my best band. And I would hope so after how many years of doing this. But I've had a lot of bands along the way. I've played solo a lot. I don't do that anymore because it's too much work. Singing is, is hard work. Singing for 45 minutes is a lot of work. Um, but yeah, I'm still playing, and I probably will until I can't. Well, I started writing songs when I was little. Uh, I've been playing guitar since fifth grade, and I would write like silly little la la la, two chords, you know, whatever. Um, and as I grew, I started to learn more chords, obviously, and I don't read music, I do it all by ear. And I drive my bandmate Nate's nut because I do a lot of alternate tuning and I chop up capos and I drive people crazy. But as far as songwriting goes, it's always been the sky's the limit. Um, some days you're lucky, sometimes you sit down and you pick up your instrument and there's a song that just lands in your lap, beginning to end, we got a bridge, it's beautiful. And some days, like just this last week, I try to write a song, every day I sat down, nothing, nothing is at zero. Sometimes the lyrics or maybe the melody comes first, sometimes you have a chord progression. I don't think there's any rhyme or reason to the way I write. I've always written with people, um, I've always had a lead singer because I don't like to sing. So like in Lavender Couch, Erin and I, we were partners at the time. So we would talk about things and we would just sit down and write about whatever we felt. And same goes for most of my other bands. We just write about whatever we feel. And sometimes they come easy and sometimes there's still songs. I'm like, God, that needs a bridge and it will never come. It's just if the muse shines on you, she does. Oh, okay. Okay. Can I just do this last question? Yep, that's totally fine. I just want to make sure we get it. All right. Actually, two questions. But that's fine. Is the how did Lavender Couch come to be? Who were the people? Well, Allison, uh, who I who was in Modern Day Scenics, who I often see playing at the Howard Street Tavern, who I admired greatly worked at Pickles, the record store I love to go to. And she knew the kind of music I liked, so she would suggest records, so we kind of became friends. 
And I just was kind of like, hey, maybe sometime do you want to come over and jam? And she said yes. And I was like, OK. And so the two of us would go and play terrible Indigo Girls covers. And we'd laugh through them. And we're just like, oh my god, what have we done? And we would play, and it was fun. Well, then Ariane, the lead singer, literally walked into the record store one day. And I was just like, whoa, who's that pretty lady? We conversed and we found out, oh, she's a singer. So I'm like, Allison, we have a singer. We don't have to sing anymore. This is great. So we got Ariane on board. And then Roselle, the drummer, this is before the internet. So I don't really remember how we got a hold of her. We must have gone down to the lesbian bar and put up a poster. Somebody knew somebody. I don't know. And what's funny, too, is like none of them really auditioned. We're just like, you're in. You play drums. You're a girl and you're a lesbian. Perfect. And it all worked out, thank God. And she was a buy one, get one free Roselle because she was dating a percussion player. So she's like, if you take me, you go take her. We're like, great. So now we have a percussion player. So that's how we came to be. We just kind of organically put it together. And we practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced until we became good. <laughs> Is there anything you would have done different? What would I have done differently? I think if I could have kept Lavender Couch together longer, because our songwriting had really taken a turn. We were greatly influenced not only by Ani, but by the Indigo Girls. And Indigo Girls had just released Nomads, Indians, and Saints, and then I think Swamp Ophelia. And the Indigo Girls had picked up an electric guitar. You, you have to keep in mind, we were only playing acoustic. So we were like, what? Emily has an electric? Well, psh, I'm playing an electric now. So right when the band ended, we had really started to evolve as a really good band and as, as songwriters. But I was dating the lead singer, and we broke up, so the band broke up. So it was unfortunate, but they went on to uh, form Echo Farm, which turned out to be a really good band here. And I played a lot of solo bands. And then I formed my next girl band, Sugarburn. And that was a good run as well. But I would extend Lavender Couch. I think if we could have had it a little bit longer. So the moral of the story is, is don't date your band members. <laughs> Quick story about this guitar. So the Go-Go's influenced me to be a musician for real. And Charlotte Caffey and the Go-Go's had a blonde Telecaster. And I played guitar since fifth grade, and I hated it. And my guitar teacher was like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to play the Go-Go's. And he said, well, go get a songbook, and I'll teach you. Great. Totally changed my life. Totally changed the way I played guitar. I loved it then. But there was a piece missing. I had like a Sears guitar. And the neck was huge, and it was terrible, and I hated it. And my dad is like, what do you need to be a guitar player? I'm like, I need a guitar like Charlotte Caffey's from the Go-Go's. And so it was a blonde Telecaster. So we looked in the World Herald. There were no blonde Telecasters. But one day, somebody had a black Telecaster for sale. And this is a 1972 guitar. And I got it in 1981. I'm only the second owner. And so we went to this little tiny house. And it was this giant biker dude. He's like, yeah, I don't want to play anymore. And I'm only the second owner. My dad bought this for $200, which I won't even tell you what it's worth now. And I have played it every day since. It's a custom Telecaster, 1972. If you look, there's little white marks on here. And this is from when I was jumping around in my room and hitting the white furniture when I was a little girl. And all the guitar marks. This thing I have had forever. People have asked me to sell it. I will not sell it. I've never sold it when I was poor. I refuse. But this is my battle axe right here. And it's all because of the Go-Go's. I play a Telecaster. And now I love it. And that is the story of my beautiful Telecaster. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. thank you.